All right, great. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight to uh, the Cub presentation about how to cut your TV costs and fight robocalls. Uh, my name is Marina Minnick, and I'm the Solar Programs Administrator with Cub. And tonight's presentation um, is being co-hosted by Alderman Matt O'Shea. So thank you, Alderman Matt O'Shea, for um, hosting tonight's event as well. So before we dive into the presentation, uh, first I just wanted to explain the webinar setup. So um, because this is a Zoom webinar, you can see me, but I cannot see you. So if you want to communicate with me, um, you can feel free to send your question in the chat, in the chat or um, in the Q&A box. And I will get to that at the end of the presentation. Um, this presentation should be around um, 35 to 45 minutes, and uh, we should have time at the end for Q&A. And um, I believe if you do raise your hand at the end during that Q&A session, I should also be able to unmute you if you'd prefer to answer that question in, um, by speaking instead of typing it. So... Yeah, um, we can dive in. So as I said, um, my name is Marina Minnick and I'm with Citizens Utility Board or CUB. And I just want to give you a bit of background information on CUB. So CUB is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with the mission to fight utility rate hikes, promote clean energy and advocate for consumer protections in Illinois. Um, also, just going to stop my video um, to preserve my Wi-Fi here before I continue on. So CUB was created back in the 1980s through the Illinois General Assembly. And since then we have been working to represent utility rate payers all across the state of Illinois. So we serve as a utility watchdog and essentially we're trying to keep your bills as low as possible and help you to avoid signing up for bad deals or scams. Um, we also advocate for cleaner and more affordable energy and energy policies in Illinois. So two of our bigger services are our hotline and our website. So our hotline's on the screen. Um, this hotline is available Monday through Fridays, nine to four. And uh, you're able to call it with any type of question you may have about your um, bills. So gas, electric, phone, cable, Wi-Fi, anything you can think of, you can give it a call. Um, I'm also our solar person on staff. So if you ever have any questions about solar, I would love to talk to you about that as well. Um, also, if you're having an issue with your utility and you tried calling them once and the problem was not resolved, you can call us next and we can help to escalate that case for you and get the problem solved. Um, we even do uh, three-way calls if that is something that would help to get the problem solved. So a call with you, your problematic utility, and CUB. It's also really helpful for consumers to call into CUB with their problems because that helps us stay informed on different issues going on and maybe different companies that are um, that people are having these same issues with over and over again. That's really good information for us to know so that we can do our jobs as well. Uh, we also have our website, citizensutilityboard.org. Um, on that website, we have dozens of fact sheets and guides about things like uh, gas and electric scams in Illinois, how to stop robocalls, um, and lower your cable bill, which is what we're talking about tonight, uh, resources about solar and clean energy, and almost anything else you could think of. So definitely head over to the website, peruse it a bit. Um, I'll be able to send some links in the chat at the end of the presentation. Um, and then I am on the outreach team. So our outreach team does around 500 outreach events a year. So we do webinars similar to ones like these. Uh, we also do in-person speaking engagements, tabling and resource fairs, and we also offer something called a utility bill clinic. Utility bill clinics give people the opportunity to come into the event with their physical bills and sit down with a CUB staff member for a one-on-one -on -one consultation. 
and the CUB staff member will then go over your bill with you, um, kind of show you how to analyze it and read each line item. We'll also make sure that you're not signed up with any bad deals, and we'll give you suggestions on ways that you can potentially uh, lower your bill or seek aid to help pay that bill. So that is a bit about CUB. Now tonight we will mainly be focusing on how to lower your TV bills and also how to avoid robocalls. So we're going to start off by talking about the TV bills. So um, really the first question you want to ask is which option for TV is going to be best for you? So that's the question we're going to be exploring over the next uh, few slides here. So if you're interested in keeping a cable or satellite service, but you want to reduce that big bill, uh, you can do something called cord shaving. Uh, you can also cut the cord completely if you want to drop cable and start either using an antenna or streaming services. Um, a lot of people end up doing cord stacking, which is definitely the most expensive thing you can do. This is when you have a cable or satellite package, and then you also have streaming services on top of that, like Netflix or Hulu. So we can get into what each of these options is one by one. So first we have the over the air and that is uh, the antenna option. So TV signals from the major networks are delivered to your home with the help of an antenna in or on your home. So this option has no monthly subscription fee. So as long as you have that TV and the antenna, you should be good to go. Um, major networks like ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, and WGN uh, don't charge for a subscription fee with their programming, which is why you're able to access it uh, with an antenna for free. Um, equipment needed, I've mentioned this already, but you do need the, that antenna. There will then also be a coaxial cable in your home, and that's what you'll um, twist onto your TV to connect to the um, antenna signal. And then also you do need a TV with a digital tuner, but most TVs built after 2007 should have that. So the pros and cons, the pros of course, are that there are no monthly subscription fees. So this is about as affordable as it gets when it comes to having TV. And the cons are the limited channel choices. So if you are someone who likes to have all of your channels, then this may not be the option for you. But if you just like to watch the news, then this is probably good. Um, also, another con is that the reception can be poor or unreliable, especially in rural areas. Next, we move on to cable TV. This is probably what most Americans have at this point. This is when TV is delivered to your home over a fiber optic or coaxial cable. Um, and this is when the packages for cable can start to get really expensive, around 60 to maybe $150 or more, depending on how many channels you have. Probably the most common or typical companies are DirecTV, Spectrum, and Comcast and Xfinity, as well as a few others on the screen. But I think DirecTV, Spectrum, and Xfinity are the ones that we hear about the most. And for this equipment, um, you need a uh, cable box or DVR. So that is something that your cable company would send to you when you sign up for the service. And it plugs right into your TV and sits on your TV stand. So the pros for cable TV, um, this is when you can get the widest channel choices, um, but you do have to pay for that. So it can be expensive and cable still is not available in all areas. So next we have satellite TV. Um, this is kind of similar to cable because it also gets a bit more expensive around 70 to $150, um, depending on what package you choose or how many channels you're paying for. And this is when TV is delivered to your home via a satellite. So the most typical companies are DirecTV or Dish Network. Um, and you'll need a satellite dish and receiver in order for this um, type of TV to work at your home. 
Um, the pros are, once again, you have a wide cha um, channel choices and satellite TV is also more available in rural areas than cable TV is. But your cons are that, once again, these packages can be very expensive. Also, reception can be poor in bad weather. Um, also, some people don't like the look of the big satellite dish on top of their home. Uh, this can also be problematic for renters. And then finally, we have streaming. So streaming is when you receive movies and TV shows um, on demand through a service that delivers content to you over the internet. So um, these are typical companies are Amazon Prime, HBO Max, Disney Plus, Apple TV, Hulu, and Netflix. So these are individual services that you have to pay for, kind of each one in order to receive whatever movies or TV programs they are um, individually offering. So in order to have streaming services, you do need to have high-speed internet at your home um, because these movies and TVs are sent to you through the internet. Um, you also need either a smart TV, like the image I have here on the screen, so that's when you plug the TV into the wall and all these apps come up automatically and they're usually marketed as smart TVs. Um, or you just need a regular old TV with um, a streaming device that is plugged into the HDMI port. And I'll explain that a bit more later on, um, but either of those two options will work for you. And so then pros and cons. The pros are that um, you could potentially have a lot lower prices. So if you're only subscribing to one of these services, your service could be at around $10 a month to get um, the TV shows and movies that you want. It starts to get more expensive when you start adding all of those um, services together or subscribing to all of them. Another way it can get more expensive is some of these um, apps or streaming services do offer um, live TV as well as streaming. So you could do that in place of cable. Um, it would just be more expensive. Uh, some of the cons are that, uh, as I mentioned, you may have to subscribe to multiple streaming services in order to get what you want. It requires high-speed internet. And it's a new format that some people may not be used to. You know, a lot of times we're used to just scrolling through the guide, looking at all the channels and seeing what's on and choosing uh, versus for streaming. You really have to turn on the TV and pick out a show that you want to watch, which can sometimes be good. And sometimes if you don't like making decisions like me, it can be a little difficult. So um, now that we've explained all of the different options, we can get into tips to reduce your cable bill cost. So uh, we, you know, the big question is which option is best for you? So we can ask these smaller questions in order to come to that conclusion. So first, what channels or shows do you and your family want? And what kind of stuff do you watch? Do you usually stick to news or, you know, just think about your favorite channels um, and think about the reason you even have TV in the first place and what channels you enjoy watching. Also think, do you need live TV or are you okay with watching something later? I know some families really like to gather around on every Monday night to watch um, whatever show may be on um, and it's kind of a ritual for them. So think about if that's something that's important to you. Also, do you need those premium channels or have you never even um, gone up past channel 50? Um, do different people in your home need to watch different shows at the same time? So this is referring to, you know, if you do have cable and you have multiple TVs in your home and multiple cable boxes, you're typically paying for all of that. So think about um, how many TVs, how many cable boxes you really need. And then consider your lifestyle. So does your schedule even allow for you to watch shows as they air? Um, also, do you enjoy getting to fast forward, rewind and pause your shows? Or are you okay with sitting down and you know watching it and um, not getting any breaks or pauses in between? So um, those are good things to think about. Also, this 
presentation is based off of two guides we have on our website, our uh, cutting cable cost guide and our guide to stop robocalls. So when this um, presentation is done, I will send those guides in, um, I'll send the links to those guides in the chat so that you can get all this information again, because I do know that it's a lot of information to take out or um, to remember. And these questions that I asked on the last slide, we both guides or the cable guide has almost a worksheet where you can kind of check off and answer those questions and keep track of them. So if you do want to print off that guide and fill out the worksheet, then that can help you to visualize what works best for you. So now that you have a better idea about what your TV needs, so this is if you do want to stick with your cable or satellite plan, um, you, there are different ways that you can shave that bill, right? Um, instead of cutting the cable. So you want to look at your current bill and you want to check each line item of your bill and make note of any charge that you don't really understand or maybe some of the charges seem to be repeating themselves. Um, so just you know, take a pen to your bill and really um, mark down what, what may be confusing to you. Then you can call your company and your cable company and you can request the cancellation department. So they have the most power to offer you a better deal because they don't want to lose a customer. So if you call them and ask for a better deal, they're the ones that are most likely to give that to you. So first, check if you can cut down on equipment. So as I mentioned before, how many cable boxes do you really need? Do you like having a TV in every room or are you okay with just one and you can get rid of the rest of those cable boxes? Also, do you need a DVR? So do you enjoy like recording um, shows on TV or have you never done that before? Because if you've never um, recorded a show, then you really don't need a DVR and you can just get a more simple cable box and then you don't have to pay for that service. Um, also, when you are talking to people on the phone and trying to negotiate a deal, it's important to remain nice and polite, but definitely don't be afraid to ask for a better deal. And don't be afraid to ask for a better, better deal a few times. Um, you can even, you know, if one day you don't get what you wanted, you can try calling back the next day because chances are a different sales representative may give you a deal that the one you spoke to previously would not. Also, make sure not to get upsold. If they're trying to offer you any free trials or free additions, think, um, think if you wanted that thing in the first place. And if they're offering it for an extra charge, definitely try to avoid accepting because you're trying to cut your bill down, not um, add things on. Also be wary of bundles. Um, so cable and phone companies offer or often offer triple play packages that will bundle TV, internet and digital phone service, but um, with a hefty price tag. So um, you may not want this, you may not need this. Typically the phone service in the package is what really has the bad deal because it's offering fe more features than people typically use. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on, but maybe your cable company offers you a good deal on uh, TV service if you bundle, um, then that's a good idea to take it. But you definitely want to, if they offer a bundle, you want to look at how much all of those separate plans would cost separately and then see what the bundle is. And if the bundle is significantly lower, then it may be a good idea. Also be open to locking in. I know um, locking into maybe a one or five year contract with your cable company may be nervous or nerve wracking, um, but if you know you're staying in the same place and will probably want the same thing, it might be worth it in order to get a lower price, especially because prices are constantly rising when it comes to cable. So if you can lock in a lower price for the next year or so, um, that may be a good idea. And then when it's over, you can call again next year and try to re uh, negotiate a good deal once again. 
And finally, take notes. It's extremely important to keep track of everything you talk about with these salespeople so that you can reference back to it and uh, keep track of different rates that you've paid over time. And finally, um, if for internet, um, let's see. When you have internet, you typically have a modem or router both that you're renting from the company. And so that's one thing to check. See if the company will allow you to buy your own modem um, so that you don't have to pay a rental fee each month. So Comcast Xfinity does allow you to buy your own modem, but AT&T does not. Um, and if you have a different company, it is worth checking to see um, so that you're not paying those monthly rental prices. All right, now we can get into dissecting one of these cable bills just so that you know what you're looking at. So this is an Xfinity bill. I think this is one of the more popular um, cable bills. So first on the front page um, on number one, that's, that will be where your account number is. When you are calling your cable company, make sure to have this handy because they typically ask for it to verify you and identify you. Uh, second is the billing date, and third is the service period. Um, so that's all pretty straightforward there. Then number four, they typically show your bill at a glance or a summarized version of your bill. So um, yeah, this will be summarized, but they'll break it down for you in the next page. So here we have the next page. Um, number five is the payment slip. Um, and then number six are the regular monthly charges and the breakdown of charges. So number six is really going to be the most important place to look at your bill to try to identify places where you can um, gather some savings there. So on this person's bill, for example, their plan has 230 plus channels and internet with 850 um, MBPS speed. So that, you know, that may be a lot if, um, if they're not watching anywhere near 230 plus channels, that could be an option for them. They could try to reduce the amount of channels or reduce the package that they're for currently signed up for. Um, also under their equipment and services, you can see that they are renting equipment each month. Um, so that is $30 just on this bill. Um, and even the add-ons, so they are streaming on top of having a cable plan. So under add-ons, they have HBO for $15, which um, you know continues to add money onto their bill. So you know, maybe they watch a lot of these channels, so it's worth it for them. Um, but if they're only watching the news, then they definitely want to call and uh, reduce that plan or even switch to antenna. And then seven is just additional information. All right, so we kind of went through options for savings. If you do want to keep your cable plan or um, satellite antenna plan, um, or satellite plan, excuse me. But if you, you know, ask yourself all of those questions and you go to the guide and do the little worksheet we have and you discover that you do not need cable anymore at all and you really just like watching the news and a few of your shows, then we can move on to this section, which is tips to cut the cord. So this is canceling your cable plan. So the few different options you have, um, you could have a TV antenna, so you get those basic channels for free. You could do just streaming, so um, streaming TV shows and movies through high-speed internet, or you could do a combination of the two. So to explain, now we have something called an HD TV antenna or high-definition television antenna. And so this antenna um, can help you to avoid those high priced cable packages. And this would serve as your standalone TV service. Um, so this is how you would get your live TV is through the HDTV antenna. 
Um, and as it says in the bottom, it does get local channels, but sometimes lagging can be experienced, um, especially depending where you live. So some things to consider. Um, first, you will want to find out what channels are available to you. So you can go to the Federal Communications Commission website um, to see what channels you get. Also TV Fool and Antenna Web. All of these will show in your location which local channels you would be receiving. So you can see if um, you know those are enough channels for you or if they're channels that you actually watch. And just to note, the HD TV antenna is much better than kind of those old fashioned antennas that we saw on TVs um, back in the day. Um, they look different, they're more sleek. And um, today you can also get them inside or outside so that they can be protected from poor weather. So anyways, um, number one, yeah, once you find out what channels you have, maybe they have channels that you like, so you want to proceed with the antenna, then you also want to make sure you have the right TV. So a digital tuner will be needed um, in order to have the HDTV antenna. Next, you need to get the right type of antenna for you. So there's a few different factors to consider when choosing an antenna. So first we have omnidirectional or directional. So with a directional antenna, you can get clear reception by aiming it toward a TV tower in the nearest major city. Um, so these antennas are better for consumers that are in further suburbs or rural areas more than 25 miles from a TV tower because they can point the antenna forward toward that major city and they won't really be getting any other feedback. Um, an omnidirectional antenna, on the other hand, can receive signals from multiple directions. So homes within 25 miles of a TV tower such as like um, if you do live in a major city or there could be a lot of obstructions, should consider that omnidirectional antenna. So if you're within 25 miles of Chicago, essentially you can get the omnidirectional. There are also amplified versus non-amplified. So in urban households where you are within 25 miles of the tower, um, you can get the non-amplified because you don't need that stronger signal. But if you are um, in more of a rural area or further away, or there's a lot of hills around you, um, then you might want to get the amplifier to pick up those weaker signals. And then finally, there's indoor or outdoor. So indoor TV antennas might be the best solution if you do live in a, a major metro area or near TV broadcast towers. So the small devices can be placed discreetly in a room. Um, and it's really helpful if you do live in an apartment building because typically mounting an outdoor antenna wouldn't be an option for you, but the indoor option is um, nice and easy there. Um, and then outdoor antennas are also an option. They can be a bit more complicated to install, but they can offer the best TV reception, especially if you are more than 20 mile, 25 miles outside of a major metro area. So um, it kind of depends where you live um, and then you can figure out which antenna you want from there. The indoor one is a bit um, cheaper. So if you are close enough, then um, we would probably recommend indoor if you can help it. Um, the other options for cutting the cable are to switch over to basic streaming. So I'll just reiterate what I talked about earlier, but First, if you're wondering what you need in your home in order to have streaming, you will need high-speed internet um, with Wi-Fi. And then, as I mentioned, you'll need either a smart TV that already has the ability to display these different um, streaming service apps, or you can have an older TV that's equipped with a streaming service or a streaming device through the HDMI cord. So, kind of to show that, I have this picture of a, the back of a TV here, and you can see that there is an HDMI input. So um, typically with the streaming device, there will be a little stick 
with an HDMI connection. So that's what you will stick into your TV. And then there will be something that kind of resembles a small cable box. And that's what you'll aim your remote at when using the streaming device. So this is actually what I do. I have um, an older TV that I got off of Facebook Marketplace for probably $20. And then I have a Roku stick that I also think I got on sale at Best Buy for maybe $15 or $20. And I just stick it into the TV. And all of a sudden, I have access to Netflix, Hulu, HBO Max, anything that I um, am signed up for. Another thing you can do if you don't want to pay for all of these streaming services is if you do have um, multiple members of your family or friends, you can always decide to each subscribe to one streaming service and then share your passwords with everyone, which I think is what um, I do with a lot of my friends. So I'm actually only paying for Hulu, but I get Hulu, Netflix, Disney Plus, and HBO Max because um, I have friends who subscribe to different things. So that can kind of be a, a cheat um, in a way to get more than what you're paying for. Um, and just a bit um, more of an up-close look at what that HDMI port would look like in the cord. Um, and then that bottom photo is an Amazon Fire Stick. So that's similar to a Roku. Um, that's like what the stick looks like that you would plug into your TV in order to make it a smart TV without actually being a smart TV. And then this big blurb of text, um, I just wanted to kind of showcase our cable guide. We have information on all current streaming services, so their name, what the subscription would be, and just some key information as well. So it is kind of up to you to decide which streaming service seems best for you and which has um, things that, which has shows and movies that you would be most interested in watching. Um, some streaming services also have live TV, so Sling TV, FUBU TV, and Hulu Plus Live TV have packages that resemble a traditional cable plan, um, so they have those, you know, the live TV and the guide that you can kind of uh, uh, click through channels, and then they also have the on-demand shows or movies that you can stream at any time. Um, so. That can also be an option if you aren't ready to let go of live TV. So now you can kind of choose your best option. First, we have um, option number one, and this is if you had an HD TV antenna with no internet and no streaming. So all you would be getting here is local TV. Now you can always supplement this with a DVD player so that you can either buy DVDs to watch movies and shows, or you can always go to your local library and rent them out for free, since usually we only watch movies once or twice. So the cost for this, um, there is no monthly cost. And then um, there may be a one-time cost for the antenna. Um, and for the DVD player, which there's a little mistake on that slide. There shouldn't be a streaming device there. Um, and then we have option two. So this is when you have the antenna and you have streaming services. So with this, you would also need Wi-Fi. So kind of looking at the cost, the monthly would be that Wi-Fi um, plus, or the internet plus any cost for those streaming services. And then the one time again would be the antenna and the streaming device. So what we mean by streaming device is um, either the like a Roku stick or a Fire Stick um, at the low end or just buying a smart TV, which would be at the upper end there. And that's again, a one-time cost. And then number three is that you have no antenna and all you have is um, streaming. So that cost, once again, there's the monthly for internet plus streaming. And here the price range is a bit wider because we can include um, streaming that also has live TV. So that can get a bit more expensive, um, but it's definitely up to you uh, for how much you wanna spend. And you can very easily keep those prices down depending on which service you choose. 
And then um, the one time cost is that streaming device again, either the streaming device or the smart TV. So yeah, those are your three options really for completely cutting the cord with cable, just getting rid of it and going to local TV and or streaming. Um, yeah, and um, if you have any questions about any of that, we'll once again have time at the end of the presentation and uh, it is also in the cable guide, which I will send a link once we're done. Now we can get into robocalls for the last little part of our presentation. So what is a robocall? Um, robocalls are pre-recorded messages from computer generated dialers. So this is when you get a um, phone call and it's someone talking, but it is pre-recorded or maybe even a robot generated voice. Um, so it's not a real person that you're talking to. So Illinois gets a lot of robocalls. For example, in April um, this year, the state received 151 million robocalls, which is around 60 per second um, just that month. And in 2021, Illinois was ranked uh, seventh for robocalls, receiving about 1.9 billion, according to the robocall blocking firm ViewMail. So that's a lot. Um, of robocalls, definitely. And um, you may be wondering, are robocalls illegal or legal? Um, so they are illegal if they are um, sale calls, unless they have written permission from the Federal Trade Commission. So robocalls that are legal and allowed are things like information only calls. So maybe your flight gets canceled and they call you or you have an appointment reminder or your child's school is closed and they're calling to let you know. Those are allowed. Um, calls from a business to collect a debt that you owe, those are allowed. Um, calls from or on behalf of politicians are allowed. Also calls from certain healthcare providers are okay. So maybe your pharmacy is calling you to let you know that your prescription is ready. And then messages from banks, telephone carriers and charities are okay as long as those entities are making the calls themselves and not through a third party. So while there are helpful robocalls, um, it is estimated that 26% of robocalls are telemarketing and 30% of them are scams. And actually in Illinois, one out of 10, Amer or, sorry, in America, one out of 10 people are scammed each year, which is total to a almost $10 billion loss. Um, in order to combat this, the Telephone Robocall Abuse Criminal Enforcement and Deterrence Act, or TRACED, became federal law back in 2019. So this act increases penalties and requires phone companies to validate calls before they reach you. So this is a way to help uh, fend off um, spam calls or um, scams. Um, it is also used to combat spoofing. So spoofing is when a robocaller will use your area code so that it appears to be someone local. So maybe you'll think that it's a friend or a neighbor whose number you don't have saved, or maybe it's a local business or service that you're familiar that you um, use. Um, using that local zip code can be very confusing because people assume it's someone that they know. So if your cell phone labels the call as scam likely or spam risk, um, that's probably because they are trying to save you from the spoofing trick. And it's probably a result of um, the traced act that passed in 2019, because under federal rules, all phone companies must utilize this technology where they validate phone calls and label them as scams or spams if they think that they are. So I just want to go through some common scams. And once again, this will be on the guide that I sent because I know it is a lot of information. Um, first is government imposters. So this is when the robocall claims to be from maybe social security or the IRS. 
and the imposter might have a fake name or number displayed on the caller ID so that they look official. And the pre-recorded voice might announce that you've been the victim of stolen identity or a participant in a crime and you must call a number to fix the matter. And at that time, a scammer will try to get your personal information. So um, never give your personal information over a phone call. And if you are confused or wondering if it's real, just hang up and you can search that agency's number online and see if those numbers match. Um, and you can even give them a call from what you find online and see if uh, whatever the scammer was saying is true. Next, we have electric and gas company scams. So this is what the robocall will begin by saying, you know, this is an apology call from your electric provider and it will ask you to press one to get a refund or discount on your power bill. And um, that's when a salesman will come and try to switch you to an alternative supplier that could easily charge you more than what your utility rate is. So be aware of those. Um, Cub typically recommends against alternative suppliers, so we really recommend um, uh, to beware. Also, there's the say yes scams. So this is when an automated voice will ask, like, can you hear me now? Um, am I speaking to so-and-so? And they lure you into saying yes. And this can, um, this recording can be used as proof that you gave permission to sign up for a costly offer that you normally wouldn't buy. So that one's a bit scarier. Um, other scams, maybe uh, robocalls might warn you that your fake warranty is expiring or they're offering low credit card rates. Um, I've seen banking apps like Venmo or PayPal call and say that someone has scammed you and will try to lure you into pressing like dialing buttons or speaking and then they're the scammer themselves. So in the end, it's just really important if someone does call you that you don't recognize to never ever share personal information over the phone. Um, even if the pitch sounds convincing, it's always better to hang up and contact the real organization with the number you find yourself. Also, never speak at all, uh, never say yes, and never dial any numbers on your phone. So that's, I'm probably just going to re reiterate what I just talked about, but once again, do not answer any questions, especially yes or no questions. Um, also, in the first place, you just don't want to answer unknown phone numbers. Um, because if it's someone that you know in real life, they're just going to leave a voicemail. Or if it's something important, they'll leave a voicemail and you can call them back. So that's number one, is just make it a habit to stop picking up phone calls from numbers that you don't recognize. And if you do answer it and it is a robocall, make sure to hang up immediately. Um, and then just make sure not to follow or not to call back or follow any instructions that they um, ask for or suggest. And again, don't dial any numbers. So now you might be wondering how you can stop or reduce robocalls. Um, so first you can confirm that you're on the do not call list. So call this number on the screen if you want to register for that list or go to this number. Um, it is true that scammers can get around the do not call registry, but it's still a good idea to join. Hopefully you'll get fewer robocalls, um, but it definitely won't stop it completely. Um, next, um, like I said, make sure to use your voicemail. So once again, um, just stop picking up numbers that you don't recognize because if it is a real person, they will go through your voicemail or answering machine and you can call them back that way. And then three, see what your phone can do for you. So if you have a digital phone or cell phone and you're constantly getting calls from the same number, you can go into caller information and block that individual caller. Another thing you can do um, for cell phones, so I'll start with an iPhone. You can block all callers that are not your contacts. So for an iPhone, you'll want to first go to your settings and then do not disturb. 
So you can turn your do not disturb on. And then under the phone section, you can go to allow calls from. And then you can click all contacts. So then calls will only go through if they are one of your contacts. Uh, just a warning, if you do have this on, then you won't be notified um, when you miss you might not be notified when you miss calls, like maybe you got a call from your pharmacy or a call from your kid's school. So if you do turn this on, you just want to make it a habit to check your call logs and voicemail regularly. And then for Androids, it's similar. You go to your settings, um, you go to then sounds and vibration, and then do not disturb. And then once you turn that on, you can go to allow exceptions custom and then contacts only um, and that way you can block numbers that you do not know. You can also ask your phone company if they offer any free services. So um, once again with landlines utilize that voicemail. You can also pay for a call block blocking device so blacklist or whitelist um, and then there's also an AT&T 60 service that's where you would add $11 a month to your landline service if you're through AT&T, but that only allows you to block up to 10 numbers from your local area. So um, it might not be worth it since these robocalls tend to come from a lot of different numbers. And then for digital phones, or if you have a landline program that is voice over internet protocol, um, they typically have free services or services you can purchase as well. So we just recommend calling your phone company and asking about call blocking um, or call protect or call screening, any of those numbers. And we have a lot more information about um, these different options in our guide as well, but I won't sit through and go, <laughs> sit here and go through them right now. Um, that might be a bit dull, but. Um, there's different options there that you can either get for free or pay for. And then there are also third party services that you can pay for. And we have more information on them as well. If, if this is something that really truly bothers you and you want to do your best to reduce and get rid of. And that is about all I have. I know I kind of sped through the end there to leave time for some Q and A. Um, but I will stop sharing my screen.